Hey guys, it's Chris at Highline Guitars. You're watching another one of my YouTube guitar building videos. If you're new to my channel, welcome. I hope that by the end of this video, I'll have earned your subscription. And to everybody who's watching, if you get something out of this video, I would appreciate it if you click that thumbs up button. So what I'm going to be talking about in today's video is I'm going to be explaining the process that I follow for creating a 3D model of a guitar body. Now, I've already talked about making the 3D model of the fretboard and the neck, so logic would dictate that, that the next step would be to do the body. And uh, in particular in this episode, I'm going to kind of lay the groundwork because the process I follow is I create a full-size, full-scale Adobe Illustrator file, and then I use those elements to create the 3D model. So in this episode, I'll show you what I do in Adobe Illustrator. And then in the next episode, I'm going to follow that with actually building the 3D model from those elements. Now, I just want to remind you that this is all part of a series that I'm producing where I'm going to be ultimately building a six string multi-scale fan fret guitar. So uh, let's jump on the computer and we'll get started. This is the full-size, full-scale drawing that I've done on uh, for this guitar design. And I've showed this in previous episodes as I was uh, talking about planning this build. And this is the same drawing um, which will be available in the package that I'm going to sell on my eGuitar Plans website. Of course, there'll be a lot more involved here. There'll be dimensions and I'm also going to include a wiring scenario for the electronics. But... Um, what I when I start designing the guitar body, uh, it, it actually the whole process starts out by creating the fretboard, and to do that I'm using the Fretfine 2D website, and I lay out my fretboard here and save it out as a single page PDF, which I can then open in Illustrator, full size, full scale. So I'll use that to create my fretboard. And then once I have the fretboard, I can then lay out the neck. And once I have that, I can start to plan the body. And I'll explain a little bit later uh, some of the thought process of designing. But what I wanted to show you here was when I start the, the plan for the body, I one of the things I want to do is I want to decide where the body is going to meet the neck. And in this case, on the treble side, the body meets the neck at the 22nd fret. And then on the bass side, it meets it at the 19th fret. So that's kind of how I start out doing it. And this is this is all purely personal preference. There's no rules here. There's no uh, specification or uh, industry standard you have to follow. You can do whatever you want. I like to do it that way because it gives great access to the upper frets. But you know, it just, you can, you can decide however you want to do that. So, but once I have that determined, I can start to create the rest of the shapes uh, for the body. And then once I have that figured out, the placement of the pickups and the bridge and, and, and all of that, which you see here, I can then separate it into a separate file, which you see down in the lower right corner. And then I'm going to copy all of this and then place that into a new document which is going to be prepared specifically for the CNC operations and the creation of a 3D model. So that's what I'm going to show you right now. Okay, what you see on the screen is a new document which I've just created in Adobe Illustrator. And the dimensions of this document are 20 inches wide, 14 inches tall. And that represents the dimensions of the blank that I'm going to be cutting the body out of when I cut it out on the CNC machine. And typically what I do is I will glue two pieces of wood together to form the blank. And these are usually seven inch wide uh, boards that I glue together so that the glue seam is the center line of the blank. And occasionally I'll find a blank that's large enough wide enough you know for the 14 inches but it's it's fairly uncommon so I typically will use two boards and glue those together and then I'll cut them I'll cut the blank down to a length of 20 inches so what I've also done here is I've drawn a box 
the same dimension as the blank and it may be kind of hard to see here so I'm just going to kind of move it a little bit off to the so that you can see that's that's the uh, the box this is a this is a bounding box and the purpose for it is some of the carving operations that I'm going to do will be done as two-dimensional carving operations in easel pro so I won't need to use a 3D model for that. Instead, I'll just use elements from this Illustrator file that I'm about to show you. And by having the bounding box and then everything centered in the middle of the bounding box, I know that when I bring those elements into Easel Pro, they're going to be positioned precisely in the center of the blank. That way, my glue seam is running right through the center, which is where it should be. It shouldn't be off to one side. So when I create this bounding box, that keeps everything centered when I place it into um, Easel Pro. And the added benefit to that is I'm going to be doing two-sided carving. I'm going to be doing the, the back side of the guitar body as well as the top side. And having everything centered within this bounding box means that when I flip the blank over everything is going to register when I carve it and I think that'll make sense later on as I continue forward with this uh, but then the first element of the body that I need to create is the body shape now if people ask me all the time how do I settle on a body shape where do I come up with it well really there's just a couple of guiding factors first of all I try to keep the dimensions within the realm of what most guitarists and guitar players are used to. So I look at dimensions of guitar bodies like uh, Stratocasters, Telecasters, uh, Les Pauls, SGs, you name it. And you get kind of a, a pretty clear idea of what those size ranges are. And I'm typically looking at the width as well as the length. And, and I'll settle on a size that I think works well. Um, and in this case, this body, it's about a little over 12 and a half inches wide. And then the length of it is about, is almost 18 inches. That seems to be a fairly decent dimension. But the thing is, is there's no rules here. So you can do whatever you want. This is just what I find to be, um, the most useful dimension and then everything else is really personal taste you know you can do single cutaways double cutaways uh, you can do this kind of offset shape like I've done here it doesn't really matter so I'll start the drawing this way and I'll create the shape like you see here and once I'm happy with the shape the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to start to build the interior elements. And I like to work uh, from the back to the front. And it doesn't really matter which way you do it. You could do front to back, whatever. I just like to work from the back to the front. It's something I've always done. So uh, it's what I continue to do. So in this particular case with this design, I'm going to use a bevel that's going to go all the way around the perimeter of the guitar. So I'm going to draw a line that indicates where that bevel starts. This is actually the transition between the flat portion of the guitar body and where the bevel angles down toward the outer perimeter of the guitar shape. So I'll draw that line in as you see it here. And this is the bevel that's going to be on the back side. And once I have that done, Next thing I'm going to do is the control cavity pocket. And this is going to be routed into the back of the body. And this line indicates the perimeter shape of that route. And it's going to be routed to a depth, usually to within an eighth of an inch of punching through the front side of the guitar. That way I have an eighth of an inch of wood covering this area on the front. And that's sufficient to hold the controls and it's durable enough that it won't crack or break. Uh, anything thinner than that, you could run into a problem. So I keep it at about an eighth of an inch, sometimes a quarter of an inch if I'm doing carved tops and things like that. But uh, for this uh, particular build, it's going to be 
there'll be an eighth of an inch of wood over the top of it. Then the next thing I'm going to do is the control cavity cover recess. I like to recess the cover into the back of the body. I don't like it sticking out. And this is just a little extra feature. And since I'm doing CNC, there's no reason not to do it. So this line represents where the control cavity cover, the edge of the control cavity cover. And I will route this into the back about an eighth of an inch deep. And then I'll use this same file later on to create the control cavity cover that I'll car, uh, cut out on the CNC machine to fit into this space here. And this also includes these tiny little holes, uh, circles you see there. Those represent the holes, the pilot holes for the screws that will mount the cover. So I'll do that as well. Then the next thing I'm going to do, this guitar is going to feature a bolt on neck. So um, I'm going to use a bolt on configuration like you see here. And this is going to have five screws that hold the neck into position. And um, I have this small hole in the center. I'll zoom in on this a little bit. The small circle represents the pilot holes for the neck mounting screws. And then the larger circles represent recesses for the screw ferrules that I'm going to use because I'm not going to use a neck plate. Obviously, it wouldn't work for this, but I'll use ferrules instead. And they'll be recessed about a quarter of an inch or six millimeters into the back of the body. Now the next element that I'm going to add to this is I'm going to switch now to the top because I have all the back elements created now. So now I'll switch to the top and so that you can better see this I'm going to turn off all the back elements except for, I'll leave the body shape on. But this first element is the top bevel. And again, this is the line that indicates where that bevel starts all the way around the perimeter of the body. And then the next element are is the neck pockets or the neck pocket. And you can't really see that. Um, I'll turn off the bevel and I'll actually turn off the body shape. That's the neck pocket shape right there. So you can see how that is shaped in there. Now you're probably wondering, how do I determine this? Well, as you've seen in previous episodes, I created the fretboard and the neck. So to determine the pocket shape here, I overlay the neck onto the body and position it where I want it to be positioned and then create the neck pocket based on where the neck is going to lay out onto this. And that way I can create this shape, which later on I'll use to cut the pocket shape into the body when I cut it on the CNC machine. So that kind of um, explains how that, that works. That's sort of the process that I use. And then the next element is the pickup pockets. And remember, this is a six string multi-scale guitar. So I'm going to have humbucker pickups that are going to be placed at angle. And that angle represents basically the angle of the end of the fretboard or the neck. So it's about the same angle. And I'm doing the same angle for both the neck and the bridge pickup, even though the bridge pickup would be slightly more angled. It isn't really necessary to do that. And doing that complicates the whole process of making the pickups and everything. So to keep it simple, I've, I've just kept the angle the same. And I think you'll find that a lot of multi-scale guitars do the same thing and for that same reason. But this line represents the shape of the pocket and then the two circles are the pilot holes for the screws that will mount the pickups because these pickups will be direct mounted right to the body. Okay, and then the next element that I have to create is the bridge mounting holes. So I'll call your attention to this area here and those are the bridge mounting holes. Now the bridge that I'm using is it's a single bridge saddle for each string and it has a mounting plate underneath it 
and these holes on the body correspond to the holes in the mounting plate. And this was all determined when I laid the neck over the body and figured out where the end of the scale length is and where I needed to position those bridge, uh, those uh, solo bridge saddles. And what I wanted to do when I placed those bridges is rather than place them or I, you know, instead of just placing them right at the end of the scale length as determined by my drawing, I wanted to make sure I would have a range of adjustability. So I need to make sure that the saddle, you know, the position of the saddle when it's mounted to the body has a little bit of forward motion and a little bit of backward motion, sort of in between its range of motion. That way, when I go to tune and intonate the strings, I have enough range to make those adjustments. I need forward range and, and backward range. Now, in most cases, when you're intonating strings, the scale length gets a little bit longer. So really, the most important uh, adjustment range to consider is the backward motion of the, um, the bridge saddle as you're intonating the string. So you want to make sure that it's you get a little bit forward, but most of it should be towards the back because you're going to have to probably make the scale length for each string a little bit longer. So that's how I determine the uh, position of the bridge mounting locations. And then the last item, and I to show you, I'm going to bring in all the other elements that I've displayed before, is the holes for the controls, the volume and tone pots and the switch. And that's where they will go. I've got um, this circle at the front here represents the uh, one of the potentiometers and the one back here is the other potentiometer. One will be volume, one will be tone. I haven't decided which one will be which. I'll probably do the front one volume and then the back one tone, but that could switch. It just depends. I got to think about that and decide what I like to do. Um, some guys like to play with volume more than they do tone, but then other guys are just constantly adjusting the tone. So it might be more logical to put that to the front where it's easier to reach with your strumming hand. So this one may be the, the tone pot up at the front here and then this back one would be volume and then this lower one is going to be the pickup selector switch so I can select the neck pickup or the bridge pickup or both of them together so it'll be a three-way toggle switch now I have room in here if I wanted to I could I could put in other switches if you know if I wanted to to do a uh, a coil split or um, perhaps phase switching or something to that nature I could do that as well. Although I typically, what I like to do is use a push-pull pot for that or a push-push pot. Uh, that way I don't have to do extra switches. All right, guys. Well, that's all I have time for in this episode. And now that I've laid the groundwork with Adobe Illustrator in the next episode, I'm going to be taking those elements and then building the 3D model in Rhinoceros version 7. So be sure to check that out. And as always, uh, I hope that you've enjoyed this video and we'll give it a thumbs up. And for those of you who are new to the channel, welcome. I hope I've earned your subscription. And um, yeah, uh, hope to see you in the next episode. So in the meantime, take care and stay safe.